today's webinar as announced is on recent advances in cardiac thoracic and vascular anesthesia this particular webinar is moderated by dr virendra arya professor of anesthesiology with the university of manitoba winnipeg canada with these words i request dr virendra to open up the webinar and carry on and i thank virendra once again for bringing up the team and presenting us one of the state of the art webinars over to you virendra thank you very much for the kind introduction and i welcome dr william pope uh, he is our esteemed guest for this webinar uh, we have three speakers today for this module 2 of the advanced cardiovascular anesthesia the first one is dr ruma bose she is from beth israel deconis boston usa the second one is from university of manitoba dr mulain and third one is again dr gordon lee so first of all uh, i will request dr ruma bose to start uh, sharing her slide so let me introduce dr ruma bose dr ruma bose actually did her mbbs from uh, jaipur and then she moved to us and for her uh, further training she became faculty at vet israel deconis medical center and now she is the program director of adult cardiac anesthesia fellowship her main accomplished accomplishment is that uh, she developed this structural heart imaging module at boston and she was given kaplan award by society of cardiovascular anesthesia in 2019 for this uh, curriculum in the heart imaging and her today's talk will be again uh, on the same uh, what is her module and uh, how it is useful in the perioperative medicine and in the education Uh, most re recently she has she is a recipient of fear grant for developing a curriculum for the use of echocardiography for hemodynamically unstable patient so uh, with that introduction dr ruma bose please uh, you may go ahead slides thank you dr arya uh, for that very kind introduction and I'm just going to start my slideshow in a second. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks again for this uh, very um, invitation, uh, very kind inv invitation to present in the webinar. Um, it is um, and and uh, and a very good evening to all my friends, colleagues, and teachers in um, in uh, India. So. Um, In the first part of first part of my talk, I will focus on 3D echocardiographic principles and its application in structural heart imaging. In the latter part, I will focus on training opportunities which are available available for us as cardiac anesthesiologists in this field. So, what is structural heart disease? Structural heart disease is a term which was first introduced by Martin Leon. in 1999 transcatheter cardiovascular therapeutic meeting to provide an overreaching term encompassing the non coronary cardiac disease processes and developing the interventional techniques the management and treatment of these structural heart pathologies is called structural heart intervention which lies in at the confluence of four distinct subspecialties cardiac surgery anesthesia radiology and cardiology These subspecialities constitute the heart team, which forms the cornerstone of structural heart intervention, and has been stated as a class one requirement for a structural heart intervention program. The members of the heart team work with the support staff, the patient, and the patient's family to devise an individualized plan for the patient, which is at which is the core principle of patient-centric care. I would like to start uh, with a bit of historical perspective acknowledging the work of pioneers who paved the way for our modern day practice the first reported cardiac intervention was performed by 
Stephen Hale in 1727, when he used pipes to access the horse's ventricle. The term cardiac catheterization was coined by Claude Bernard in 1885. Then came the discovery of X-ray by Rongen in 1890. 1890. This disruptive innovation changed the way diagnostic medicine was practiced around the world. In 1929, Werner Forsman cathed himself and watched the catheter traverse the heart under fluoro. Andreas Grunzik performed the first coronary angioplasty in 1977 and is considered by some as the father of modern cardiology. One of the early reported uses of interventional radiolo radiology was in the extraction of bullets from wounds during World War I. In the, in the famous uh, Arthur Compton one said that X-rays have saved as many lives as they have destroyed in all the wars since their discovery. Whether or not this is still true, in the early use of X-rays in war are clear, clearly seen some of the most striking achievements of diagnostic radiography. Echocardiography is the most commonly used imaging modality in structural heart imaging. Although echo technology had been around since the 1940s, the larger profile of the probes limited its application in cardiac imaging. Esophageal ultrasound was first reported in 1971 to measure flow in the aortic arch. The modern era of GE really began in 1982 with the introduction of flexible phased array transducers. More recently, transesophageal echocardiographic probes are capable of producing real-time three-dimensional images, which is widely used in structural heart imaging. Thus, over time, the role of TEE progressed from, monitoring, from a monitoring modality to more of a procedural adjunct in cardiac interventions. Progress in imaging technology has gone hand in hand with progress in inter interventional cardiology. In the past, the procedures were limited to valvuloplasties, pulmonary vein isolations, which were performed under fluoroscopic, uh, fluoroscopic guidance. With the advent of 2D echocardiography, procedures like left atrial appendage occlusion, ASD closures, paravalvular leak closures became more popular. With the new 3D technology, transcatheter edge-to-edge otherwise edge-to-edge -edge repair, otherwise called mitral clips, became possible. Now a whole host of advanced procedures are being developed due to the advancement in 3D technology. So for the residents and fellows in the audience, the question to ask is, what does 3D echo offer that, and that 2D echo does not? The simple answer is perception of depth on, depth on a flat projection. 3D images are analyzed and evaluated on flat displays on which different shades and color, color tones are used to create a perception of depth. 3D imaging is made possible by the 3D matrix array probe, which comprises of 2,500 piezoelectric crystals, each of which can be independently activated to volume scan and acquire raw three-dimensional data. Each crystal can be independently activated, focused and steered to generate an ultrasound beam in two planes, the azimuthal plane, which is the XY plane, and the elevational plane, which is the XZ plane to cover a 3D pyramidal, pyramidal data set. There's a fundamental difference between two-dimensional two -dimensional and three-dimensional echo imaging is how the image is acquired and displayed. The 3D scan plane has three dimensions, the axial, lateral, and eleva elevational dimension. In contrast, the 2D scan plane has a lateral and an axial dimension. Once the data is obtained, the data storage feeds it into the data processing unit. The data processing unit consists of two integrated steps, which are called conversion and interpolation, which transform the scanned raw data uh, to create a full 3D image, which is displayed on the monitor. Therefore, 3D echo is superior to 2D in providing spatial orientation, it is free of geometric assumptions, able to provide anatomical correlations in three-dimensional space 
and depth perception in a single view. This makes it invaluable in structural heart imaging, which relies on precise location of devices and catheters in relation to structures and anatomical boundaries. As we know, the only limit of ultrasound imaging is the speed of sound in the tissue, which is 1500 meters per second. That is how long it takes for the signal to traverse the tissue and back to the transducer. Thus, 3D imaging is a complex interplay of two factors, temporal resolution, how fast you can see the image, and spatial res resolution, how well you can see, see the image. And finally, how much do you really want to see and how, uh, how quickly you want to see it? For instance, if you are seeing something very fast, you are not seeing the details well enough. Understanding this principle is very important for 3D imaging. Based on these factors, the 3D imaging mode, mode consists of real time, which is the live mode, and the gate in mode, that is time to EKG over multiple heartbeats. This is an example of the real time mode, which is a real time narrow sector mode. Real time refers to any 3D imaging that changes on the display as the probe is moved. Narrow sector allows a high resolution image, but the entire structure in this case, in this case, um, we are seeing the mitral valve is not visualized in one image. Think of it as a torch in the dark when you're seeing a small aspect of the space you are in. This mode can be used when you're looking for specific anatomic defects or, uh, for example, clefts or vegetations on the mitral valve. So what you, would you do if you want to see the whole structure in high resolution? Full volume, is, full volume mode is an EKG-gated acquisition of a large 3D region of interest. The large area is divided into individual wedge-shaped subvolumes that are obtained over consecutive heartbeats. This is done by tracking the R wave of the electrocardiogram. These subvolumes are then combined together and synchronized to the same cardiac cycle to display the full volume data set. Downside is the need for apnea and normal sinus rhythm. This mode will not work with AFib or other arrhythmias. So let me see, this is an example of how, sorry. Okay, this is um, an example of um, the R wave gated acquisition. So you can see the small slices of the image are being acquired with each R wave in a normal sinus rhythm. And once that is done, all of them are stitched together to form one full image. And finally, you get a very high resolution image um, uh, of the entire region of interest. Moving on to some other imaging techniques that have proven invaluable in structural heart imaging. This is simultaneous orth orthogonal plane imaging, allows visualization of multiple planes of data set in at, same, at the same time. For a given region of interest, the reference plane is kept stable, but the other planes can be manipulated freely at different angles. Okay. Um, so this is, um, um, the red plane is the stable uh, and angle which keeps the region of interest in, in, uh, in view. And the green plane is can be manipulated in different angles. And this is a, a very, again, very valuable in structural heart imaging to see a single object with different uh, perspectives. To show you an example of uh, multi-plane imaging, which I just talked about, this is a four chamber reference view, uh, which is uh, demonstrated on the left upper hand corner. The, um, the other uh, views are orthogonal views and um, uh, which are simulta simultaneously displayed in the B and C part of the, of the display. So the interplane angles are here chosen by, uh, at 60 degrees by default, but they can be steered electronically to any desired angle. This allows us to examine <clears throat> the left ventricle from different angles 
without having to move the probe or change any omniplane. The next um, uh, equally helpful is in structural heart imaging is the surgical or the on-course view, particularly of the valves and devices. This mode allows imaging with higher spatial resolution. It is ext extensively used in transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair for initial, ass initial assessment of the mitral valve and also for clip positioning and post-procedure assessment after mitral valve deployment. Here are some more examples. So you can see the mitral clip here um, uh, and plot cell device for LA, LA perforation in this view. The Watchman device, um, which the on pause view that you see right here, uh, pulmonary vein stent, uh, valve, and, valve and valve uh, view of the mitral valve, and a paravalvular leak closure device. So structural heart intervention requires a clear understanding of the principles of echocardiography, both 2D and 3D, and how to apply those principles for image optimization in standard and often non-standard techniques to optimally guide the procedure. This slide demonstrates the workflow of mitral um, uh, of um, uh, uh, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. So first is we see a 2D image of a mitral valve with a flail posterior uh, leaflet. Next. The same valve in um, 3D using the on force view and the multi-plane imaging. Uh, next comes the transseptal puncture. Here you are seeing the orthogonal view of the interatrial septum. The left panel so shows the rims, the anterior and the inferior rim of the trans of the interatrial septum or fossa ovalis, and the right panel shows the orthogonal superior and inferior rim, rims of the fossa ovalis. Next is the height from the mitral annulus using 2D. This is the catheter that uh, the uh, sheath that is that is going across the interatrial septum and carries the mitra clip from the right to the left side. The mitra clip is being positioned with the on force view. Uh, this is from the left atrial atrial aspect, and um, we spend a lot of time trying to optimize this um, position. So the mitra clip is uh, positioned right over the flail here. Now, once we are satisfied, it is being moved into the left ventricle. It's um, right at the annulus and move maybe more into the left ventricle. Next is the 2D view. The um, mitral clip has been introduced into the left ventricle and withdrawn. The mitral leaflets, which um, are being grasped by the grippers, as you can see here, right here. Next is uh, the final 3D evaluation of the mitral, mitral clip positioning. And once we are happy with that, we um, do a color, color flow examination to see a significant reduction in the mitral regurgitation. So that's a very short um, review of the mitral, um, mitral clip. So when everything goes right, uh, it's all in good. But there are instances when things don't go the way you want to. And these are some of the examples of that. A severe MR caused by malpositioned mitral, mitral, mitral valve. Next is uh, in the lower panel, you can see the uh, left atrial appendage, uh, a watchman device, which, um, which uh, let loose from its original position and is in the left atrium, a very dangerous situation, obviously. So um, where do we stand in this whole scenario? So um, it, has, uh, it has impacted our practice as a cardiac anesthesiologist. How does it matter for us if some, uh, in some, how does it all matter for us? In some ways, I feel that our role as echocardiographers is trans transitioning from periop arena to structural heart imaging experts. The nature of cardiac surgery is changing as well. I will share some data with you in a little bit. So the, uh, what's the definition of a structural heart imager? He's an integral member of the heart team with special ex expertise in cardiovascular imaging. 
either single modality or multi-modality, skills and advanced imaging techniques and technology, and proficiency in intra-procedural intra guidance. What are the requirements and competencies? First is integrated, integrative imaging. At the center of inter, uh, interventional cardiology is multimodal imaging, which is being able to view cardiac structures simultaneously using different imaging techniques. In this example, we see a fossa ovalis being viewed under different imaging modalities, toroscopic projection in the left panel, the CMR, cardiac MR in the middle, 2D echo and 3D echo, thus providing a complete information with regards to anatomical boundaries and orientation in three dimension, which would not have been possible with one imaging modality, especially when precise location is essential for success of the intervention. While these have been recent significant improvements, improvements in multimodality imaging, using multiple imaging techniques independently requires the operators to mentally fuse the images together in real time, which can be very cumbers cumbersome. Fusion or overlay imaging allows the spatial and temporal alignment of images from different modalities to be merged into one comprehensive hybrid image. This approach addresses the high demands of sophisticated imaging and valvular in intervention by displaying anatomical structures as well as device details on only one screen. Additionally, the structural hard imager has to have the knowledge of equipment and devices being deployed, the indications pros and cons of each in order to be able to guide and anticipate problems. And lastly, most important is the knowledge of workflow to be able to communicate echo findings in a nomenclature that is commonly understood by the interventionalist. Thus, thus the usual up, down, left, right does not work in this situation. So why is it important to talk about structural heart imaging? This slide shows the growing market share and the size of imaging modalities associated with structural heart imaging, echo, MRI, and CT, all of which have shown a continuous growth over the past few years and are expected to grow over the next future in the near future. This graph demonstrates that there's a steady increase in aortic stenosis interventions per 100,000 adults over the age of 60 years largely due to an increase in the number of towers. More notable is, the, uh, is, is the, it is in the patients who are 80 to 90 or more than 90 years of age. <clears throat> this report of the cardiovascular provided compensation in 2021 shows a dramatic increase in the number of towers being performed by a cardi one cardiologist. <clears throat> The procedures performed have increased from six in, by one cardiologist in 2011 to 36 in 2021. Similar trends are visible in transcatheter edge to edge repairs for mitral regurgitation. This graph demonstrates the trends in mitral valve surgeries over the years. In 2000, in, uh, 2000 mitral valve replacements were more common as compared to mitral valve repairs. In 2005, the repairs started becoming more pop becoming more popular. In 2013, mitral clips were approved, and while the numbers of mitral valve replacements have stayed the same, the mitral clips are becoming more and more uh, viable as an option. This graph shows the <clears throat> comparison of TAVRs versus surgical AVRs for aortic valve inter interventions. The number of towers performed have exceeded isolated towers in, 19, in 2015, and in 2018, towers exceeded the number of all towers performed, uh, performed in the U.S. How does that impact our practice as cardiac anesthesiologists? We are seeing changing demands in anesthetic care in being called upon to provide guidance for structural heart interventions. Our roles have evolved from periop echocardiographers to echo navigators and co-proceduralists. We are seeing patients with significant comorbidities and more of the procedures are being performed in non-operating room settings. How is, all uh, is it different from any other inno innovation we have experienced in our careers? It might sound a little cliche, but in this case, we have a, we have a chance to be part of the innovation and contribute 
don't contribute to it rather than being silent observers, expand the horizon and expand the horizons of our practice. We are already there. Our skill sets are aligned with those needed for inter interventional cardiology. If you look at the description of periop echo by ASA and that by interventional echocardiography, they are pretty much the same. What we our role in the OR is what is required in the interventional echocardiography suites. The transcatheter procedures in the operating room sit, set, uh, OR settings were part of our guidelines way back in 2010, before structural heart happened. The recent publication in uh, Journal of American Society of Echocardiography elaborated the use of TE in surgical decision making in the operating room. These guidelines, guidelines are applicable to valve assessment in structural heart imaging suites. However, there are challenges to incorporating the structural heart imaging into our practice. Although similar, there is a learning curve which requires specific training and exposure to structural heart procedures. It is difficult to implement a universally, universally applicable training model, some of the factors being a rapid growth in structural heart intervention. There, the rate of innovation precedes training and application in, in, in most cases. There is variability in case mix and case volumes. The practice is split between cardiology and anesthesia. To give a perspective on the variability of practice in interventional echocardiography, <clears throat> there are 274 cardiology training centers in the US and 80 adult cardiothoracic anesthesia programs. There are 500, uh, 500 hospitals performing towers and transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repairs. Not all training programs can provide structural heart disease exposure and vice versa. Fewer centers are involved in clinical trials and investigational procedures or centers of ex excellence. So there is no normal, uh, normal um, uh, uh, practice norms in the US. <clears throat> so considering these challenges, the parent societies combined to put forth the first training guideline in, in interventional echocardiography in 2019 in the form of a consensus, consensus statement. The guideline identified interventional echocardio, uh, echocardiography as a standalone specialization defined by specific milestones and competencies, and also provided a frame, framework for a training program in structural heart imaging. The training pathways were built on echo competencies de described by core cardiology training symposium, which is the guiding body for cardiology training. It divided the echo training into three levels and added level three structural heart disease as an added competency after completion of uh, the three levels of uh, training. The guidelines also suggested case numbers that was required for gaining level three structural heart imaging co competency, which included 75 interventional echo procedures and broken down based on specific interventions. In drop T for surgical valve repair and replacements were a large part of the requirements. This is what we do in the OR. This indicates an indi agreement between the authors regarding the parallel skills uh, skill sets between periop echo and structural heart imaging. The specific guidelines were suggested for cardiac anesthesiologist. As we know, 300 echocardiography evaluations are required for National Board of Echocardiography certification. The guidelines suggest 75 of those should be uh, is structural heart imaging procedures, 35 of those should be reviewed and 40 performed. More recently, the American Society of um, Echocardiography published detailed recommendations for special competence, competence in interventional echocardiography. These guidelines, guidelines complement the expert consensus statement. It also acknowledges the challenges with developing a curriculum in a variable practice milieu in the US and the additional uh, fiscal hardship for the fellows, which comes with prolonging the length of their training. It tries to focus on competencies rather than as an endpoint rather than the duration of training. The guidelines specifically address cardiac anesthesiologists and recommend, recommend additional six months of focus training to develop uh, structural heart imaging competency. 
As we can see here, the recommendations are very similar to, to the expert consensus. The only difference is that the cardiology fellows who would like to specialize in structural heart imaging can dedicate majority of the third year of training to gaining ex uh, experience in structural heart imaging. Specific mention was made for practicing anesthesiologists and fellows in training. Trainees and pathways suggested um, uh, uh, the requirement was completion of um, adult cardiothoracic anesthesia fellowship to be el eligible for additional six month training in structural heart imaging. More importantly, anesthesi anesthesiologists like me with work experience who are, uh, who are also ECOBIRD certified in uh, cardiac anesthesia can develop their, their experience on the job and develop their competency in structural heart imaging. This can be achieved by working with a mentor who is an expert in structural heart imaging or by attending, attending industry-led workshops and courses. So the recommended duration of training was six months for cardiac anesthesiologist and nine to 12 months of focus training for cardiology. And in the last bit, I'll mention a little bit about our own structural heart uh, imaging program uh, at Beth Israel, which we started in 2019. It's a six month long fellowship. The eligibility is to be fellowship trained in cardiac anesthesia. The fellow, it's also self-funded um, the fellow works as a cardiac as an attending two days a week with full call responsibilities and rest of the time is dedicated towards stretch, structural heart fellowship. We have um, uh, we are a center of excellence here at uh, the Beth Israel um, uh, re with regards to structural heart imaging. We have four operating rooms with hybrid capabilities, uh, seven interventional cardiologists uh, and we do a wide complexity of cases. Last year, we did about 500 towers and 80, uh, 80 to 100 um, mitra clips. The, the procedures are also done very frequently. The curriculum consists of preclinical proficiency with the goals to develop complex psychomotor skills, understand spatial orientation and probe manipulation, understand the workflow of um, structural heart imaging, understand nobology for Im image optimization, all of this is done in outside the OR in a non-pressured -pressure, uh, environment. This is a snapshot of our sim lab with the fellows uh, practicing on mannequins. We also, um, for the clinical proficiency, um, we base it on apprenticeship model. The fellow is assigned procedures with an expert in structural heart imaging. We practice graded progress, progression of skills. Each procedure is broken down into component parts or modules. Mastery of one module is recommended before proceeding to the next. This modular approach ensures proficiency in all the components of the procedure. The salient cases are recorded and can be reviewed on the, uh, to understand the procedural nuances and aspects as well as communication. The, uh, two under, uh, the, the fellows under, also spend some time with inter interventional cardiology to understand the processes of patient selection, participate in rounds, understand workflow, understand heart team model. They scrub into cases with cardiologists and have a firsthand experience of the procedure. At the end of those six months, they get a diploma from Harvard Medical Schools commemorating their fellowship in structural heart imaging. And these are our six uh, fellows we have graduated in the in the past, uh, the five fellows of, uh, we have graduated in the past few years. And finally, your life does not get better by chance, it gets better by change. Thank you so much. I do appreciate your time. Thank you very much for that elaborate presentation. And uh, we will take the question in the end from the audience also. So I will request uh, Dr. Mulain Thorleifson to present her. She is going to talk about the Texas scan. Uh, can you share the slides, uh, Dr. Thorleifson? So Dr. Mulain Thorleifson, uh, Thorleifson is a section head of cardiac anesthesia 
at the University of uh, Manitoba, and she is assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, uh, Perioperative and Pain Medicine. She has special interest in the focus, and we are running uh, actually now a training program for the faculty and resident, which is named as Focus and Perioperative TE. And she is the instructor for this program and as well as the BEXA scanning and development, developing more modules uh, in the BEXAs. So Dr. Thorlesen, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the introduction, Dr. Arya. Can you hear me okay? And are my, screen, my slides appearing correctly? No, you have to go to the uh, full slide mode. You are in the, yeah. Go ahead because we can see your next slide also. Are we good yeah, there? No, no, it's yeah, we are good now. Perfect, excellent. Okay, um, so again, uh, as Dr. Arya mentioned, I'm here to discuss VEXA scanning, and I'm very excited to talk about this topic. Um, I really enjoy this particular POCUS technique. Um, thank you to Dr. Arya and for the Indian College for all the work that goes into coordinating such presentations and for the invitation to speak. And again, congratulations to India today for the success of the Chandrayaan moon landing, which happened earlier today. So today I'll be talking about VEXIS, its development as a POCUS technique, and a bit of a how-to guide for VEXIS, and then some new frontiers for VEXIS and a local case presentation for how we are using this. So what is VEXIS? VEXIS is uh, the Venus Excess Ultrasonography Score, and it's primarily used to assess volume status on the venous side of the circulation. In this way, uh, the IVC, the liver, both the portal vein and the hepatic vein, and the kidneys are imaged. And we've known for a long time that uh, venous pressure is an important thing to consider <clears throat> from an organ perfusion standpoint. As far back as 1931, Winton had reported that raising venous pressure had a greater impact on urine output than the same decrease in arterial pressure. So we've known for a long time that this was critical. And clinically, we know that fluid overload is problematic. It causes splanchnic venous congestion, acute kidney injury, liver congestion, intestinal edema, and as a result, um, malabsorption, and pulmonary edema, this, this extends to the left side. But conversely, excessive diuresis can also result in acute kidney injury and hypoperfusion. So finding that balance is really critical for our patients. And we know that CVP and measurements of IVC diameter on their own have their own limitations in hypervolemia assessment and, and are problematic when used in isolation. So what we're really thinking about here is organ perfusion. And organ perfusion is dependent on the upstream arterial pressure and the downstream venous pressure. And we want to optimize the, the perfusion to those organs to optimize function. <coughs> Excuse me, Vexus was initially developed as a means to use POCUS to predict acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery. And this was a, an initiative that was taken on by an anesthesiologist intensivist, an intensivist, a nephrologist, and two emergency room physicians. And they came up with this grading system. They looked at um, some of the things that have been looked at historically, including hepatic vein Doppler, portal vein Doppler, and then intrarenal venous Doppler, and looked at uh, the uh, particular pulse wave Doppler patterns that reflected volume overload. And then they came up with a system that included multiple different um, uh, permutations of abnormal findings in order to determine which best predicted acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery. And it was this third uh, group of patterns, this VEXIS C, uh, that resulted in the best prediction of acute kidney injury. So VEXIS C is a combination of looking at first IVC, and if the IVC is less than two centimeters, then, then you stop it. There's no indication to proceed with VEXIS scanning uh, and no indication of venous overload. If the IVC is more than two centimeters um, and there's normal patterns or mild abnormalities, then this is sort of a grade uh, one abnormality of uh, venous overload. If the IVC is more than two centimeters and there are severe abnormalities in at least one pattern, then this is considered grade two um, venous uh, congestion. And if the IVC is more than two centimeters and you have severe abnormalities in multiple patterns or at least two uh, or more, 
then this is grade three venous congestion. So this is that interpretation of just what I was discussing there. So this is the guide for predicting clinically significant venous congestion based on this research. And we'll come back to this again, but first we'll go through each component individually and describe sort of a how-to for each of the imaged vessels. Um, and just uh, you know, a bit of a comment about the development of VEXIS. This uh, imaging of these particular vessels goes back more than 30 years. So the group of people was putting together, together information that was already known, but this had never been added to a formal echocardiographic assessment when looking at heart function or a POCUS assessment for, for volume overload. The concept of excess is based on uh, resonance within the vascular system as it becomes more non-compliant due to hypervolemia and sort of like tenseness within that system. And in this situation, the atrial pulsation waves are transmitted uh, more proximally into portal and renal veins. High venous pressure acts as afterload for renal vessels and it blunts the diastole flow in renal arteries. And the advent of POCUS, um, this bedside ultrasound technique, uh, in general, really allowed the development of this score, in which multiple systems are interrogated at the bedside, uh, and uh, this information can be put together to allow a comprehensive overview in real time. This pocket card, uh, which is a very elegant pocket card and really summarizes uh, the VEXA scan is from the POCUS 101 website. It shows the anatomy that we are interested in and uh, discusses all of the normal, mildly abnormal and severely abnormal findings and puts them all together to assess venous congestion. So if you're going to be using uh, VEXA, this is a very useful pocket card to keep with you. So step one, as we mentioned, is looking at the IVC. So you can see here that we're doing a subcostal view with the phased array cardiac probe with the indicator pointing um, cephalad. And here we are looking at the IVC in that subcostal view and measuring the IVC. Uh, optimal location is about two centimeters from the cavo atrial junction. Here's the right atrium and the IVC. And this tends to be um, uh, just distal to the entry of the hepatic vein joining the IVC. There are three hepatic veins and they come together uh, in a confluence here to enter the IVC near this cavo atrial junction. And that's where we want to measure the IVC. Again, if the IVC diameter is more than two centimeters, we would proceed to the next step. It's not indicated if it's less than two centimeters. Here we're demonstrating the sniff test with the IVC, which many of you will be familiar with. That's not part of EXIS, but it's another one of those pieces of information that can be used clinically in a spontaneously breathing patient. Um, the next step is to do hepatic vein Doppler. So here we are looking at uh, the hepatic veins as they enter into the IVC. It's critical in this view to keep the Nyquist limit uh, sort of less than 20. We're at 23 here on the pulse wave Doppler. And you really want to measure the pulse wave Doppler uh, at the, sam the sample site for the pulse wave Doppler at the area of turbulence, which tends to be at this confluence of the hepatic veins just before they enter the IVC. This view is a subcostal view, so just uh, angling slightly to the right from that IVC view to get that hepatic vein view. Um, but you can also measure this uh, in a transhepatic view. So again, here we've got uh, the uh, subcostal view at the center of the patient's abdomen, and you slide laterally to that mid-axillary line, and you can see the hepatic veins through the liver as well. Here we're seeing left and, and middle hepatic vein, and the right is obscured. This is a normal hepatic venous pulse wave Doppler waveform where you can see that we've got forward flow into the IVC in both systole and diastole and a normal A reversal. So this patient does not appear volume overloaded based on this one indice, but of course we put them all together. Just a quick point about some of the pitfalls with VEXIS. It's very important to uh, image the uh, vessels in that area where there is the most turbulence or the most flow, again, close to that confluence of the hepatic veins. This is the same patient as the previous slide with the pulse wave Doppler um, uh, sample area placed too high in the hepatic vein, and you can see we don't get a very good um, image there. 
Having said that, um, it's important to know that the, the actual velocity of flow is not critical. The most important thing is actually the relationship between those uh, wave velocities. So uh, a normal um, hepatic vein Doppler shows a higher systolic flow than diastolic flow. And we still see that pattern, even though it may not be totally optimized or directly lined up with the hepatic vein flow, this is still useful. So if you're unable to adjust the pulse wave Doppler angle, that's okay. You still get useful information. This is a patient with a severely abnormal hepatic vein Doppler. And you can see here that uh, systolic flow is reversed and we only have forward flow in diastole, which is in keeping with a severely abnormal hepatic vein Doppler signal. Again, here's a normal signal on the left-hand side of the screen and that severely abnormal pattern on the right. Step three is to look at the portal vein. Again, we can do this in that transhepatic view where we're looking at uh, the patient in the mid-axillary line and uh, using the phase array probe here with the indicator pointing cephalad. This is what the portal vein looks like in that view. Um, you can see that the flow is, of course, in the opposite direction from the hepatic veins. So in a normal portal vein, we get this uh, flow towards the probe. Um, and when we uh, interrogate that with pulse wave Doppler, um, we get typically a, a pulse wave Doppler signal that looks like this. So there's very little pulsatility in the portal vein. This portal vein flow obviously appears towards the liver and opposite of the hepatic veins. Here we're starting to see some pulsatility in that portal vein uh, Doppler. So we can see that uh, throughout the cardiac cycle, we have some alterations in, in the pulsatility of the flow there. And that is starting to get looking abnormal. So we assess this based on the degree of pulsatility and they've called this the pulsatility index. More th less than 30% is considered normal. We're measuring this as Vmax minus Vmin uh, divided by the Vmax. Mildly abnormal is 30 to 50% and severely abnormal is uh, greater than or equal to 50%. And for those of you who are paying attention closely, this really truly should be a pulsatility fraction or a resistive index. Um, renal vessels are imaged uh, just a little bit more posteriorly and inferiorly from where we've seen the uh, portal vein and the hepatic veins. Again, you can continue to use the pulse, uh, the phased array probe here. Uh, it's also very possible to use the curvilinear probe. Here we have the patient lying lateral, but you can also have the patient sitting and image from the posterior uh, aspect of the patient. The key thing here is that we're looking for interlobar vessels, not the main renal vein or artery. This is what that looks like on, um, on color Doppler. So you can see there's just very, like sort of flickering of flow uh, with the Nyquist limit very, very low. We're at 15 centimeters per second here. And when we uh, take that sample volume, we capture both arterial and venous flows. Arterial uh, flow appears above the baseline and venous appears below the baseline here. This is a normal renal Doppler where there's continuous venous flow and then pulsatile arterial flow. And this uh, reflects the downstream effects of right atrial pressure and interstitial edema within this encapsulated kidney. So normal shows, again, continuous monophasic flow in the venous side and, uh, and a pulsatile arterial flow that doesn't uh, continue down to the baseline. As it becomes severely abnormal uh, from mildly abnormal, we get uh, discontinuous biphasic flow, systolic and diastolic, and then eventually we get just discontinuous monophasic flow only in diastole. And the uh, downslope on the arterial flow velocity also becomes steeper. Um, so again, just a summary of that interpretation as we discussed before. So if you have more, two or more severely abnormal patterns, that's severe venous congestion. So how do we use VEXIS uh, clinically? There are lots of different applications and this particular uh, case series, I think really demonstrates the wide variety of cases for which this is useful. In their case series, they describe four cases. The first was a patient with cirrhosis and congestive heart failure, and VEXIS was used to guide diuresis until those indices were normal. 
In the second case, a patient presented with right upper quadrant pain, this was thought to be a calculus cholecystitis until Vexus showed severe venous congestion, which prompted an echo, but showed severe biventricular failure. The third patient had pulmonary hypertension and severe mitral regurgitation. And in this case, they had a chronically dilated IVC and a chronically elevated CVP. So those indices were not helpful. In this case, Vexus was used to guide diuretic and inotropic therapy after the mitral valve replacement. In the fourth case, there was a pregnant patient who underwent urgent cesarean section and developed DIC. She received extensive volume resuscitation for hypotension, more than six liters, and she was thought to be volume responsive. Uh, but VEXA showed venous congestion, and in fact, echocardiography showed that she had RV dysfunction related to volume overload, and that was the driver for her hypotension, so that dramatically changed management. I'd also like to talk a little bit about new frontiers in VEXIS, and this includes doing VEXIS with TEE. Um, this has not been validated, but it is something that uh, multiple uh, uh, areas are, are exploring because it's super useful for our cardiac surgical patients in particular, but also in those cases where we get called in uh, to assess patients who are unstable um, in the operating room or in the recovery room. So there are sort of two approaches. One is to do this from a mid-esophageal view, and the other is to do it from a transgastric view with some flexion, so uh, verging on a deep transgastric kind of a view. To look at the IVC on TEE, you can start from a mid-esophageal view, rotate the probe clockwise to look at the right atrium, you advance to the cavoatrial junction, the IVC and the hepatic veins, and then you can explain to see the orthogonal view, which shows you the IVC in two planes as well, which is probably a better indicator of, uh, of the actual size. The other option is to do this transgastric at the level of the papillary muscles. We flex to see the RV short axis with the crystal angle at 60 degrees. We draw until we see the IVC atrial junction. And in this case, the image is flipped. So the hepatic veins are closer to the probe and the IVC is further. So in that transgastric view, you actually get the analogous view to transthoracic. So this, these are two images of the IVC. The first is done from the mid-esophageal view, and you can see that um, that looks similar to the, um, um, this one does not look similar to our transthoracic. And the image on the right, which is the deep transgastric, looks more similar to our transthoracic images, which we're accustomed to for Vexus. Um, here's another view of that um, transgastric view of the IVC and the right atrium. So you can see that's a very similar view to our uh, transthoracic. And the IVC is measured in the same way that we would um, in our transthoracic views. Sorry, there we go. Um, the hepatic veins can be viewed, again, you would just advance or withdraw slightly from the previous mid-esophageal view of the IVC if you're doing that mid-esophageal approach, and you can use color doppler to optimize the angle. Or if you're doing it from the transgastric view, you do a slight rotation, adjust the crystal angle, and advance and withdraw the probe to optimize and view the hepatic veins. This is a picture of the hepatic veins on uh, transesophageal echo in that transgastric view. So again, you can see the nice entrance of that confluence of the hepatic veins into the IVC. Um, here's a, the a pulse wave Doppler image of the uh, hepatic vein that was imaged. This is a patient in the cardiac OR. In uh, a patient with severe biventricular dysfunction who was immediately post cabbage. He was on dual inotropes and was remaining slightly hypotensive, and the clinician was unsure of whether fluid administration was indicated or not. And in this case, the IVC was less than two centimeters, and we can see that we've got forward flow in systole and diastole. So further fluid administration was indicated in this patient despite his severe biventricular dysfunction. Um, here's another view, again, of those hepatic veins. Um, we can also image the portal vein from this view. Uh, from the view, uh, from the hepatic veins, it's important to rotate the probe. You may need to advance or slightly withdraw. 
And uh, in the mid-esophageal views, then the portal vein appears a little bit more uh, in the far field. And in the transgastric views, the portal vein appears in the near field. So if you look closely at this video, you can see that we're seeing both the hepatic vein and the portal vein in this view. The portal vein is in that near field area. This is the pulse wave Doppler of the portal vein for this particular patient. And you can see that there is probably some mild venous congestion indicated by the uh, pulsatility of the portal vein. This is a patient, uh, again, who has imaged the previous patient where we were trying to determine if the fluid administration was required post cabbage. And we can he see here that there is no pulsatility in that portal vein. Renal vessels are a bit challenging on TEE, um, partly because this is something that we don't do routinely. However, it's very doable uh, with a little bit of practice and, uh, and some opportunity to, to uh, uh, do the transgastric views in particular. From mid-esophageal view, you can rotate 180 degrees to image the descending thoracic aorta. You advance until the left kidney is seen. You may need to rotate counterclockwise. Or in the transgastric view, you can put your crystal angle at 90 degrees and rotate counterclockwise from the descending aorta short axis view. And then you advance the probe until the kidney is seen. Again, we can see those interlobar vessels on this kidney. Uh, in this one, you can see that the crystal angle is at zero degrees. So we're seeing the kidney in short axis, not in longitudinal axis. And we have continuous venous flow with pulsatile arterial flow on this particular patient. So uh, fluid administration is probably reasonable. They're not volume overloaded. Here's another uh, image of the kidney in uh, longitudinal view. So you can see we have sort of a long axis view of the kidney. And here you can see that the venous uh, flow appears above the baseline due to the angle of interrogation and the arterial flow below the baseline. So you must interpret these with caution because of anatomy and also because of positive pressure ventilation. I'm going to move on to a quick case presentation uh, of a patient that we uh, looked after in our cardiac ICU. And I'm just gonna come back quickly to that pocket card just to remind everybody of what we're looking at. The patient's a 78 year old man with a past medical history of type two diabetes, dyslipidemia, chronic kidney disease, and uh, baseline creatinine sort of in the 110s. He initially presented in December of this past year with a missed anterior STEMI. He was medically optimized and sent home with planned cardiology follow-up and saw his cardiologist later on in that month, same month. And he ultimately had his outpatient angiogram in January. Angiogram showed severe three vessel disease and an LVDP of 27. He had no significant gradient uh, across the aortic valve and they didn't do an LV function assessment because of his renal dysfunction, but he was referred to cardiac surgery. He presented again in January with acute decompensated heart failure. This was his chest X-ray at the time. Uh, his heart looks enlarged and there's small bilateral pleural effusions um, with bibasilar atelectasis and his NT pro BMP was 15,000. Um, he had a transthoracic echo the, the day after presentation that showed mild dilation of his LV, but severe LV systolic dysfunction and no significant other findings other than mild AI. His heart failure was treated with diuresis and afterload reduction, and he went to the OR as an urgent but planned cabbage. In the OR, a balloon pump was placed prophylactically, and he had a four-vessel cabbage. He came out of the OR on dual inotropes, but low dose, milrinone 0.2, epi of 0 0.02, and norepinephrine of 0.13, vasopressin of 2.4. Uh, his balloon pump was removed on post-up day one because he had developed moderate aortic insufficiency. When he was seen by our team, he was awake and alert. He was peeing, um, but he had some crackles to his lung bases. May represent atelectasis, hard to say at this point. Sats are about 95%, and uh, his hemodynamics were a, a little bit uh, on the lower side. His uh, blood pressure was 104 and 48. He also had a poor central venous sat of 54%. He had some ongoing low dose vasopressor requirements and his lactate was increasing. It was up to 2.9. He remained on low dose milrinone, but just a single inotrope at this point. This is his chest X-ray. You can see he's got a little bit of bibasilar atelectasis 
and small bilateral pleural fusions are now identified, um, but no convincing pulmonary edema from the team here. So the question is, how do we manage this? So these are our options. I'm just gonna come out of the uh, PowerPoint here. We'll see if we can do the, this Slido here. Um, so if you're able to, you can uh, uh, vote on the, on the poll. So um, the question is how to manage this patient. So do we want diuresis, fluids, increased inotropic support, diuresis plus additional inotropic support or fluids plus additional inotropic support. So, so far we just have a bit of information and uh, we'll continue on with a, the VEXUS presentation. So here's his transthoracic echo images. You can see this uh, biventricular dysfunction, so, well, severe LV systolic dysfunction. In this view, we can appreciate that there's no significant tricuspid regurgitation. And this is what his VEXA scan looked like. Excuse me, I'll switch the display settings again. Um, so this is the IVC. His IVC was measured at 2.81 centimeters. So we're uh, further VEXA scanning is indicated. And, uh, and we're not surprised that his uh, IVC is dilated. In this patient, his IVC is probably chronically dilated. So this may not be a helpful measure. This was his hepatic vein Doppler. You can see here that this actually looks normal. He's got forward flow in systole and uh, forward flow in diastole with the A reversal. So this doesn't suggest that this patient is fluid overloaded. His portal vein Doppler confirms that. We've got just mild pulsatility in this portal vein. And uh, so again, this looks like they're, he's not severely volume overloaded. His renal vein was well imaged. We've got a very nice picture of his kidney there. And his renal vein Doppler, um, a little bit more challenging to acquire, um, but here we can see that there aren't uh, discrete systolic and diastolic um, flow velocities. So overall, it looked like he was not volume overloaded. And this changed his management. So this patient was then treated with fluid. He got a unit of pack cells and 500 mils of crystalloid. And uh, low dose epinephrine was added to his treatment regimen given his LV systolic function. As a result of his fluid resuscitation and uh, addition of the inotrope, he had decreased vasopressor requirements. His lactate uh, went down to 1.3. His venous sat improved to 66%. And his oxygen requirements uh, decreased to three liters from five. Uh, so I think this is a very uh, good case presentation about how this is useful. This is a patient who historically we probably would have just diuresed and add, added inotropes to, but the VEXA scan was able to indicate that this patient was actually going to benefit from additional fluid, which was unexpected. And again, in the ICU, we use this scan very regularly. Every time I do a POCA scan for a, a patient, I also do a VEXA scan. Um, in patients in the recovery room who are hypotensive and we're unsure uh, what the appropriate management is, POCUS plus VEXUS is extremely useful to guide either inotropic therapy or vasopressor therapy or fluids or a combination of all of the above. So thank you very much for listening to the presentation about uh, this particular uh, scanning technique, which I think is extremely useful and will become increasingly useful in the future. And uh, we'll take questions, I think, at the very end after Dr. Lee's presentation. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thorlipson. It was an excellent presentation. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will take the questions in the end. And I will request Dr. Gordon Lee to uh, share his slides. Sorry, just give me two seconds here. I'm just trying to find my. So, Dr. Gordon Lee uh, did his uh, post graduation training. Uh, he's a cardiac anesthesia fellowship at the University of Manitoba. 
And after that, he joined the faculty as assistant professor in Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine. He took lead for developing the anesthesia for the minimal invasive cardiac surgery at our St. Boniface Hospital. As well as he is also the uh, postgraduate uh, fellowship uh, uh, lead for the St. Boniface Hospital. And uh, he has also taken the lead to develop this uh, cardiac anesthesia protocols for the minimal invasive pulmonary thromboembolectomy, which is done in the hybrid, hybrid suit. So, uh, oh, I think I have it on the wrong one, sorry. Uh, Dr. Lee, please. Yeah, we are. Does that look okay there? Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So okay. Dr. Lee, please go ahead. Sorry about those uh, technical issues. Uh, uh, thank you again for Dr. Ayer for inviting me and thank you for the Indian College of Anesthesiologists for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be invited to you guys here. Uh, so my topic is the ASEC considerations for minimally invasive pulmonary thromboembolectomy and other pulmonary embolism management devices. And I put minimally invasive uh, minimally in quotation marks because it's often described as less uh, invasive, but there are significant implications, particularly for our side of things, uh, as they can be quite complex patients. Uh, just to start off, I have no disclosures, uh, I have no affiliations and, uh, with any uh, companies or the products that I'm discussing about. So I'll talk about uh, quickly about uh, the acute uh, uh, management uh, of acute pulmonary embolisms, some of the new catheter-based treatments that are, have been developed for pulmonary embolisms, and the idea of a uh, PER team or a pulmonary emboli response team uh, and what our role in, in that is. Uh, as well as uh, the other Im uh, important thing is our, what are our anesthetic considerations for, for these people that, are, that may be coming to us, uh, as well as uh, 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 the management of the interventional procedures uh, with acute PEs. So just a quick summary on pulmonary embolism. It's still one of the, the most common uh, acute cardiovascular syndromes, just behind like a uh, major MI, and account for 300 deaths a year in the US, more than 370,000 a year in Europe. And a, a lot of them are quite unstable. A third of them die before therapy can even be in, uh, uh, other deaths are, uh, are, are people who die before any therapy can be initiated. Uh, our population uh, has many risk factors for it, including recent surgery, DVTs, uh, venous stasis, cancers, infections. So that's a lot of our perioperative population there. And that also, if we're managing our post -op, uh, perioperative post -op, uh, patients, they, uh, they can be significantly affected because that's one of the contraindications that thrombolytics and or uh, anticoagulation, which may make it uh, routine management, very challenging in a lot of our patient population there. So one of the challenges is, uh, with um, a management of PE is it can be very deceiving. They can present with a wide variety of symptoms and signs and with varying levels of severity. Uh, they can present from uh, asymptomatically incidentally discovered to mild nonspecific to full-on cardiogenic arrest, arrhythmias, uh, and uh, chest uh, uh, um, uh, uh, cardiac arrest as the presentations. Some of the symptoms that are really, uh, the symptoms that they, they do present with are often fairly nonspecific, such as cough, chloric, chest pain, hemoptysis. And one of the most kind of important delineating factors that will help us uh, decide what type of treatment that they will receive is their hemodynamics uh, stability. And I'll uh, touch on that a little bit more later. 
So some of the issues of the physiological sequelae of peas that, that, that they may, may develop lung infarcts, they, they often have gas exchange abnormalities, including hypoxia, hypercarbia. Uh, they can present with cardiovascular collapse, or sorry, a compromise, which could be RV dilation, dysfunction, increased PVRs, uh, arrhythmias, and when they when you do more biochemical analysis, they often present with uh, increase in troponins, BNPs, uh, and uh, often in their CT they also have abnormalities such as RV dilation. So as I was mentioning, one of the most important th uh, factors uh, is the initial assessment for hemodynamic stability because this is one of the most important factors in delineating what type of uh, treatment uh, algorithm to go for. So uh, what I mean by that, the, it's often defined uh, as uh, if their systolic blood pressure is less than 90, or if they have a, a drop of more than 40 from their baseline uh, for greater than 15 minutes, if they have hypotension requiring vasopressors, inotropes, uh, or if they have clear evidence of uh, a shock or organ malperfusion, such as increasing lactate or uh, uh, increasing creatinine. And, and another thing you have to do is rule out other causes uh, that be, can be causing such as sepsis, MI, hypovolemia. Uh, these people contribute uh, uh, compromise about 5 to 10% of the the patients with pulmonary but they have an exceedingly high mortality risk, uh, and their mortality risk is uh, is thirty to fifty percent. And within those, uh, the the highest risk of death is actually within two hours of presentation. So these people are are very hemodynamically unstable, uh, as well as uh, it's a urgent to emergent uh, presentation there. And the risk uh, remains elevated for quite a while, too, for up to like 72 hours after the initial presentation. So the, traditionally, uh, for at least for hemodynamically stable patients, the traditional management is your IV anti, uh, your anticoagulation with either IV heparin uh, or DOAX are also being increasingly utilized uh, as well as IVC seal filters for patients who may not be uh, 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 considered for anticoagulation because of uh, risk of bleeding. These, this patient population uh, uh, are not recommended for thrombolytics, which is uh, a, a escalation of care. Uh, and this, that's what is recommended for the people who have hemodynamic unstable patients. So the first line therapy for all, a lot of these patients is systemic thrombolysis. Uh, so this is complicated by major bleeding uh, with kind of risk uh, of up to 20%. Intracranial hemorrhage is 2 to 5% quoted. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the patients who do present uh, hemodynamics, there are uh, contraindications to thrombolytics. Or if uh, a small percent of the patients, uh, uh, up to 8%, do not respond to thrombolytics. So... Uh, that's where a lot of these new kind of therapies have been developed for. So here's a list of the contraindications for systemic thrombolysis, as mentioned earlier. I won't kind of read them all, but any type of major bleeding, uh, stroke, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, are, as well as um, uh, some of the human dynamic uh, measurements that are relative contraindications such as high systolic pressures, coagulopathies uh, are also uh, contraindications and may limit the use of thrombolytics. Before these catheter, de catheter developed uh, therapies, really the next step that was really offered to us is surgical embolectomy, which is uh, a, a very significant surgery uh, complicated by the use, uh, uh, potential use of IV thrombolytics, heparin, uh, and dual uh, and DOAX, uh, and uh, a large percentage of our population may not be candidates for surgery. And patients who do have uh, uh, thrombolytics, the, those patients had a mortality rate of uh, three times higher than patients who did. So these were. Uh, uh, high risk procedures of mortalities of 
quoted between 15 and 30 percent uh uh and so these are uh uh with uh, uh is procedures that have high risk so since then um uh many different things have been developed it, it's it's not as advanced as a lot of things that Dr. Ruma Bros was mentioning. So a lot of these things have been developed over the past decade or so. Uh, uh, one of this is the pulmonary amyloid response team, uh, and that's similar to the like catheter heart team. I'll discuss that a little bit later. And the so what's been really emerging in these, these are these catheter developed therapies here. So catheter directed lysis uh, and embolectomy. I'll talk a little. And so where that kind of goes in your treatment algorithm, sorry if it's a little bit hard to see, is in the hemodynamic stable, uh, unstable patients who uh, are, are have contraindications to uh, thrombolytics or, uh, or do not respond to thrombolytics. So with catheter-directed thrombolysis, the, what they do is uh, they put a catheter uh, right into the uh, pulmonary arteries, and they have a multi orphous catheter uh, like the one you see that directly injects uh, TPA uh, into the pulmonary embolism and artery there. So the theoretical benefit of this is they generally use a smaller dose of thrombolytics, about a quarter of what they would be giving systemically. And so there's been, uh, so there's a reduction in total thrombolytic dose and, uh, uh, and potential more directed uh, TPA uh, towards the pulmonary embolism and better uh, clot uh, burden removal. There's also uh, a newer device. Uh, it's not currently approved in the Canada, but it's being FDA approved in the US. And so that also uses ultrasound. So that's the one in the lower bottom right corner. So it's a larger catheter, uh, this one, but it uses ultrasound to help break down the PE to allow more thrombolytics, uh, thrombolytics to enter the embolism and break it down. So these are generally done percutaneously through uh, uh, femoral or IJ uh, vein sheath. And the other types of devices that are used are more of a mechanical thrombectomy devices. So these start getting to larger sheath. So the big two ones are going to be your uh, indigo penumbra, which is on your top right, and your, uh, your flow retriever device. Uh, and we just got recent uh, approval from Health Canada to use those over the past two or three years. So the main benefit is, of this one is uh, generally that you can eliminate the need for thrombolytics or, or drastically reduce it. Uh, uh, and so uh, similarly to the thrombolysis uh, catheter devices, these are put in directly into the PA where the, your pulmonary embolism is. And the indica penumbra uses uh, as an aspiration through a large bore catheter to remove the sheath, whereas the flow retriever has a, a retrieval device where they it inflates and you pull out the PE through the, the sheath. And so that one has a fairly large sheath, 20 to 26 sheath, uh, compared to the penumbra, which is 12 to 14 French. And the uh, the, the one of the largest of the devices is the angiovac. So this is a more of a suction debate based device, except it's much larger than the indigo penumbra. So this one goes up to uh, the, the catheters are 22 size. And so these are actually uh, FDA approved venous cannulas because uh, to use these devices, you actually go on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. And you're using the suction generated by the carbopulmonary bypass to aspirate the clot, uh, and and you're directing it uh, often under TE guidance uh, to suck uh, apply suction directly to the the pulmonary envelopes. And so, whereas the other ones are often put in, in into the main PAs or the uh, the right or left PAs, this one is usually used more for clot in transit. So 
clot on uh, uh, adhering to the right atrium or the, the right ventricle or onto like catheter tips like central lines. Uh, and so this one is, is quite invasive as, as usually multidisciplinary because it's in conjunction with cardiac surgery, cardiac anesthesia, and or interventional radiology or cardiology, depending on uh, your site that you're uh, uh, that and whoever's most most proficient on these devices. And so essentially, these people are put on BV ECMO uh, as you're creating a large suction through one device uh, that is traditionally put in through the right IJ, uh, and you're reinfusing blood. Uh, with a filter uh, that was with the thrombus filtered out to prevent a, a reinjection of the thrombus there. And so this is how the device generally works. So you'll in the the top of the picture you'll see the angiovac cannula being put in through a sheet system. It, a bag with saline and heparin is uh, being dripped into this filter system. Uh, and the centrifugal pump creates a negative suction that will be applied to that venous tip and reinfused into another venous, like most traditionally it'd be the right uh, or the right or left femoral veins there. Uh, so uh, it's not only being used in clot and transit right sided thrombus. Uh, the other place it's being used more and more is for vegetation and endocarditis. Uh, although that's still being, this, a lot of the stuff is still relatively experimental. And so we may be seeing it a lot more for management of an endocarditis as patients, uh, as for patients as this uh, device is being utilized more and more. So uh, we had one case where we uh, used this Andrew Vacans uh, and the, this was a young lady who had un very unfortunately had metastatic cancer, uh, who had multiple PEs uh, and was fairly symptomatic. And she was essentially oxygen bound uh, on the ward. Uh, unfortunately, she also had a lot of PEs uh, of a, a thrombus in transit, in transit. And this was done as a palliative procedure in conjunction with the a number vice. So the penumbra device was used to remove the PE to ho hopefully uh, improve her respiratory symptoms, but the angiovac was used to remove that clot in transit. And so, so here's a uh, four chamber view of the patient's heart, and you can see uh, uh, that there's a large thrombus kind of in the right atrium there. And so, so now, now we move to a uh, bicable uh, view of the heart. And here you can see that funnel shaped device that's being deployed. And you can see the thrombus on your left side around nine o'clock. And you can see as the suction builds up, uh, uh, we help uh, direct the catheter toward, toward the thrombus, and as suction is generated, it will uh, hopefully aspirate the clot uh, and remove it, uh, and removes it, removing the risk of uh, further PEs uh, destabilizing the patient. And so this is what the, the, the aspirated material looks like and the filter system that prevents it for, from being reinfused into the patient and what it kind of looks like afterwards. The other thing that has been kind of developed and initially described from a team from Massachusetts is what's uh, uh, described as a pulmonary embryo response team. So it's it's a it's often involves multiple disciplines, and which discipline that uh, will be involved with will really be site specific, site specific, and dependent on whatever local service available. Uh, I think NSC is a large, major, important input and current management, and just as these, as these uh, procedures get more and more invasive uh, and involved, uh, we're gonna be asked to be, become more and more involved in these uh, type of procedures 
invasive therapies that are offered. And the whole uh, thought process behind it is it's, it's a, a shared decision model regarding they're the high ri highest risk PEs and the optimal uh, uh, management of these subsequent patients. So as you see, this is kind of uh, from one of the uh, papers that discusses PERT. Uh, unfortunately, you can see the anesthesia is not over, uh, located there, but I think this is an error that we should often be involved with. At, at this, and at our site, we have been kind of uh, highly involved in uh, uh, the PERT team and its development. So uh, as I mentioned, these these P procedures are often urgent emergent. These patients are, are either hemodynamically unstable or failed a therapy and or uh, destabilizing. So the, the patient population that we're going to be often seeing for these type of procedures are going to be have uh, significant uh, cardiac dysfunction uh, as well as potential oxygenation ventilation issues. The site that we're doing is also going to be a lot more challenging depending on what type of uh, uh, equipment you have available to you. These are generally off-site procedures. Uh, ideally, if you do have a hybrid suite where uh, 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 fluoroscopy is available, that would be the ideal suite, but uh, a suite to do it. But unfortunately, that they're not always available. Uh, and one of the biggest things that we'll have to decide is can these be patients be done under local sedation versus general anesthetic? Because uh, pa putting patients on uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation can be uh, quite detrimental to patients with uh, uh, free, uh, recent PEs and uh, and exacerbate their uh, hemodynamic instability. Something like an angiovac system, which requires cardiopulmonary bypass, will the decision will be made for you. Uh, as T is often used it lies with that, but something uh, like the catheter directed lysis may be a little bit more of a, a decision based on their presentation. Uh, the other issue with these, these people are often on anticoagulation, like I mentioned. So uh, uh, there's always a risk of uh, bleeding in these type of procedures, including cardiac cap med, pulmonary hemorrhage, even with our lines, you may want to consider where you put uh, a central line because uh, you may want to put it in an area that's more compressible, like your an IJ or femoral. And uh, these patients have the uh, with the catheters going in and out of the heart. There's always a risk for arrhythmias, and they can develop shunts because the high right side pressures can unmask uh, PFO that was there and cause right to left shunts. So I'll talk a little bit about RV dysfunction. And so this is one of the most common uh, causes uh, of death in patients with PE. And the reason why is these are generally, uh, the RV is generally a thin wall structure, poorly adapted to RV afterload. And this often leads to what's called the RV death spiral with RV dilation, dysfunction, poor cardiac output, and and that just, and if you don't correct this quickly, this can lead to rapid deterioration. Uh, these people, the hypoxia and hypercarbia is poorly tolerated by these patients because that'll increase the PVR, further worsening uh, RV dysfunction. And this is where I think our, our cardiac anesthesia skill set can be quite helpful. I think those TE and TTE skills can help really rapidly diagnose, prevent, and manage RV dysfunction there. And so this is just from the ESE uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, and uh, there's multiple ways to uh, views that you can measure your uh, signs of RV dysfunction, uh, inclu uh, including volume status, which th these are all transthoracic pictures. You can often get analogous pictures in TE as well, uh, including dilated RV. The RV, versus LV ratio that's described in B here is often one that they'll use in interventional radiology as a sign of improving uh, uh, RV function and, and they will use that uh, to help guide their therapies. 
flattening of the septum is very important because uh and where afterload management becomes important because as it shifts more your your that bowed symptom is going to uh act as a buttress uh to the rv and if you don't have that buttress the rv function can clearly deteriorate quite a bit as well and so again rv failure management uh, these people are very volume sensitive you can give cautious volume but this is where i think that te or tt is very important to really judge volume uh, uh see if it's appropriate to give additional volume because over loadings people can distend the rv and worsen ventricular independence and cardiac output uh vasopressors ionotropes i think are a must for these type of uh, patients uh uh, the ESC guidelines mentions norepinephrine and uh, dobutamine as common ones. I also like vasopressin and epinephrine. It's whatever site, uh, whatever medications you're most comfortable using, I think are important. And I think the other thing to always uh, discuss in these patients is the potential deterioration and ECMO support uh, and what types of escalation of care are going to be utilized in these type of patients. So respiratory management is also uh, a significant issue. Some of these procedures, like I mentioned before, could be potentially done under local sedation, uh, but it should be chosen very judiciously because uh, as, as excess of sedation uh, can often lead to hypoxia, hypercarbia, uh, as well as the supine position, which often uh, takes about anywhere between one and four hours for a lot of these procedures can exacerbate RV dysfunction. And the, the site that you're doing it out of OR, particularly, uh, you may not have all your airway adjuvants and there there may be need for a rapid conversion to general aesthetic and clinical deterioration. Uh, PEEP optimization is also important because, as we all know, uh, excess of PEEP will increase the PVR, but uh, uh, inadequate PEEP will also lay, lead to atelectasis and hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstrictors, uh, uh, vasoconstriction, sorry. And so that will uh, uh, play a, a part as well as, as also considering something like a pulmonary vasodilator, such as nit nitric oxide. And the, the other thing to think is, is for other potential causes like hypoxia or patient, uh, high side right pressures may unmask a a PFO and cause a right to left shunt and maybe another cause of hypoxia in your patients. So intraoperative management for these patients, uh, uh, I think the biggest uh, decision point is going to be local and sedation versus general anesthetic, and that will be highly dependent on the 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 stability of the patient coming in as well as the procedure. Sometimes these patients may already be IC in the ICU and uh, coming into intubated ventilate. So that uh, that kind of may take some of the decision process away from you. But these people are often the most hemodynamically unstable uh, uh, of the PE patients and often have uh, are gonna be have significant RV dysfunction. So I think it's prudent to have good arterial line access central line access, I would avoid non-compressible sites like subclavian, particularly if they are on any anticoagulations. And I think this is where our TE skills and our TTE skills will be very beneficial since we have, uh, we'll have an idea of RA function going in uh, postoperatively and, uh, and help direct some of the, the procedures. Uh, I think it's important to have inline vasopressors and inotropes for all these patients. I would consider things like vasodilators and defibrillator pads for pre-induction as the all, they're going to be prone to arrhythmias, not, not only because of the RV dysfunction, but from all the catheter manipulation as well. And all these patients should be uh, at least discussed for uh, are they candidates for ECMO and uh, should they uh, uh, and what how prepared should we be, including wires or cardiac surgeon on standby? 
Uh, so in summary, polymerism treatment is continually advancing. It's, it's a fair bit far behind uh, a lot of the cardiac interventional procedures that Dr. Ruma Bose was mentioning, but there's been a significant uptick in the past decade. There's going to be an increasing use of its percutaneous options and its management. And I think we're going to be increasingly involved in uh, its care. And I think cardiac anesthesia is uniquely suited for its management and uh, uh, its future direction there. Thank you for your time. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it back to Dr. Arya. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. And I will invite all the uh, speakers to be on the board. And uh, I can see a couple of questions from the audience. So first, uh, I will take the audience questions. And then probably I will also have some questions after watching your so uh, vivid and uh, elusive presentations. So I will direct my first question to Dr. Ruma Bose. And this question is, are cardiac anesthetists performing or allowed to perform ECO for structural heart diseases in cath labs? Thank you so much for that question. And it's also very valid in our current practice. Uh, so in the US and Canada, there's no set rule that there's no set rule that the cardiac anesthesiologist cannot go and practice in the cath lab. And at our institution, we are providing 100% of those uh, guidance for uh, interventional, echo card, uh, in, interventional procedures. But there are other centers where this is not happening. I think the the so there are no while there are no rules, but if you have made a, a kind of a rapport with the with the cardiologist and you have your skills are up to par um, to what they are expecting, we I see no reason why you should be going. You, you should not be stepping into the field. I I uh, beg in ignorance for the situation in India, but I think our skills are very much at par with what is required for interventional echocardiography. And as um, cardiac anesthesiologists, we should make every attempt to, to really step into that field. Yeah, and I can just share our experience at San Boniface Hospital. Actually, we work as a team and uh, as, as and when we are involved with the team, actually it is just like a team decision. Many times the cardiologists come, but many times if they are uh, facing any problem, they actually definitely they uh, hand over uh, the things to us. Like some of the cases where the ASD, some some of the ASDs in adult which had the congenital element also they were involved. So like you know our group is more focused. So they like uh, listen to us. They handed over to me because I have a, uh, some experience in the congenital heart disease. So I think we work more of a team. Dr. Mullen, would you like to comment on this question? Yeah, I think um, having anesthesia involved is great. I don't. I think that this is a, a skill that we have, the perioperative transesophageal echocardiography, and that dynamic echocardiography is certainly something that's within our sphere. Um, and again, here at St. Boniface, it, it has historically been sort of a combination of the two um, with involvement of both cardiology and anesthesia, um, depending on somewhat based on, on human resources. And so that's something that we're looking to expand from an anesthesia standpoint, though. Yeah, and I fully agree with this. Like when we are growing in this technology, it is also important to grow in the teamwork and the mental sharing model where there should not be like ownership issues because ownership issue is devastating. And now the successful land, landing of Chandrayaan is one of the good example of a teamwork where there is no ownership issue between the different teams. So I think we need to get about for that. The second question I will be directing to Dr. Thor Lipson. Uh, this question is, is the BEXUS validated in pediatric population? So it's not yet validated in the pediatric population, but that has certainly not stopped people from using Vexus in peds. The biggest limitations in pediatrics are that first step in Vexus, where you're looking at the IVC diameter. Um, obviously, that's age dependent. So uh, the people who are using Vexus in pediatrics are using sort of standardized measures of IVC to determine whether the IVC is, is generous in size 
or not, um, but they're going forward with the other indices as well. There have been a few studies um, with decent numbers of pediatric patients, and they found that the renal interlobar vessel Doppler correlated the best with um, CVP measurements when they did it in pediatrics. And there is currently a study ongoing that should hopefully be published in the next 12 to 18 months, looking at uh, validation of VEXIS in pediatric post-cardiac surgery patients to predict AKI. So the original indication for VEXIS, so that is ongoing. Um, so I think that we'll continue to see uh, increasing use in pediatrics and uh, increasing validation in multiple patient populations, but, but officially not yet. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next question, Dr. Gordon, it's for you. And the question is how to decide which catheter-based therapy is appropriate for the patient? Thanks for the question. That's a great question. I think the, the initial uh, decision point should be kind of based on what uh, clinical experience at that site, because these are all fairly new devices. Uh, and I, I think each center should develop at least a little bit of expertise before uh, with uh, a, a single device before moving on to other, but there are certain uh, differences about each type of uh, device. The catheter-based lysis is usually a smaller device, uh, but still uh, is giving thrombolytics at a lower dose. So if you still have an absolute contraindication to thrombolytics, that's uh, not uh, an ideal uh, device whereas the embolectomy devices uh, uh, can get away without any uh, thrombolytics. Uh, but those are kind of limited uh, more by size, and they cannot uh, be placed as uh, distally because there are larger catheters for mechanical aspiration. Uh, where, whereas the angiovac that we talked about uh, is more of a device for a more uh, uh, clot in transit, it theoretically can be done in PA, but it's a lot more difficult to maneuver due to its size. And uh, there's, uh, there's concerns about kind of perforation risk, although there have been newer devices that have been generated that's smaller caliber, uh, and they're hoping to release that soon, I believe. Yeah, there is one more question coming for you, Dr. Lee. So the question is, now, when these devices are around and we have this team, uh, pulmonary thromboembolectomy team. So these patients are uh, received in the emergency room and probably they uh, undergo the quick focus. Now, do you think, are there any still indications where they should go directly to the OR for uh, surgical pulmonary embolectomy or they should be directed to the hybrid suit for the uh, this minimal invasive pulmonary thromboembolectomy? So how you make those decisions? Uh, I think that's where I, having something like a per team is very important because they can help triage and identify what resources are available either at your site or potentially sister sites or affiliate sites and what can uh, where they can be directed to the best uh, uh, care because uh, one site may not offer something that the other site uh, can uh, and so ideally for the less invasive procedures would be uh, uh, preferred, but if you're not com comfortable with some of these devices or you're, you, you have no kind of sight or experience, as well as well as having these devices in stock, unfortunately, some of them are quite expensive and are, cus or, and are custom ordered, uh, so you may not uh, have the, the availability time-wise to go for something like an uh, angiovac system, which we currently have to custom order and takes about uh, a day or so to arrive. Uh, so, but the things that surgical embolectomy uh, currently offer that none of the devices do are sim uh, certain types of clot in transit, particularly the ones we've done here are the ones with clot trapped in the PFO, uh, where uh, clot in transit. So those are the big ones where we ha have uh, done surgical embolectomies for. Yeah, thank you very much for that answer. And actually, I will add to that uh, question's answer that uh, the, some of the patients in the emergency who look very, very high hypoxemic, but very, very less symptomatic in terms of hemodynamic stability and their respiratory rate, 
like just like the COVID, like, you know, early phases of the COVID, the people are like talking, but their saturation is very low. Similarly, the people who are having embolism, they are hemodynamically stable, but very, very hypoxic. They're most likely their PFO is open and they may have a clot in the transient. And that's what uh, we have. I have also encountered a couple of patients where actually the uh, old lady was pretty stable in the emergency, but they were she was diagnosed with the embolization, and the, this embolus has passed into the LA, and one clot was sitting in the transit, and she was hemodynamically stable because of the shunting of the blood, because the RV was offloaded, and she was the case which was taken for the surgical embolectomy, and. Very important thing here is that when these cases are taken for the surgical embolectomy, the surgeon should not only close the PFO and remove the clot for, from the LA, but he should open the pulmonary artery also to remove the clot from the pulmonary arteries. And here there is a limitation of the TE sometime because the TE cannot, can only look toward the right pulmonary artery, but it cannot look toward the left pulmonary artery. And that is why it is very crucial to go for the, look for the left pulmonary artery also for any residual clot, because once this PFO is closed and clot is removed from the left atrium, actually their RV can totally decompensate if there is no removal of the clot, which is sitting actually either in the left pulmonary artery, which is likely to be missed on the TE. So next question, uh, Dr. Ruma, it is coming for you now. Uh, and the question is, so, you know, I saw your images of the structural reconstruction. I, I was really impressed. And we also have the 3D Philips machines and we also try to do some of this structural amazing. Your images were very, very impressive. And some, many times we struggle to get that much, you know, uh, very crisp images on the uh, 3D. So I will have two questions for you. The first question is, have you any experience with this 3D reconstruction of imaging with the different machines from GE, Philips, and Simon, and which machines you are having? And are there special tricks or special uh, software for getting these uh, uh, images, which are so crisp in your case? So thank you so much uh, for that question. And you're right, in the beginning of my career, and even now I'm in a learning phase. So that's the beauty of structural heart. It always puts you in a very, um, in a learning, some sort of learning curve. So as the technology is progressing, yes, the, the type of in, in image quality is definitely increasing, but uh, we do have all the three vendors that you were speaking of, GE, Philips, and Siemens, and we are normally using uh, Philips and GE in, the, in those rooms. And nowadays there's uh, actually packets that are coming um, where you can use multi-planar reconstruction and it's become very easy. It's real time. You don't have to store the image, go back and uh, do it uh, offline. But um, so all of these things are actually the machines are making it better. But uh, to add to that, I would say that knowledge of knobology, knowledge of in-depth physics, how you can optimize your images, um, uh, it comes with practice and also application of uh, what uh, what you're looking for. And um, I think uh, that's where it is. It's a work in progress. And um, thank you for appreciating the images, but it can only get better. So, uh, Mulain, next question is for you, actually. So this is, uh, you know, this is one, one of the people like which we, uh, they fail to understand it. Like why vexers when we have so other things to do it? Actually, in cardiac failure, it is one of the very crucial uh, question is, should we diureize the patient more or should we use the inotropic support for the heart? Because many times when the heart is in failure, minimal inotropic support, they will still, like you will feel like they are congested and probably you will diurize more. But if you keep on diurizing, actually they start rising in creatinine and actually uh, it goes to a vicious spiral. So now this question is for you, like what are the limitation of VEXA scan? So there's a few Other limitations in, yeah, a few limitations. I, I think one of the things is that it doesn't discriminate between volume and pressure overload. And this actually has its ups and downs. So um, in concert with doing 
echocardiography where you can look at the heart and you have a reason for pressure overload, you can, you know, that might trigger you to do an echocardiographic assessment. For example, if the patient has a pulmonary embolism, like one of Dr. Lee's patients, um, they will have an abnormal VEXA scan from high pressures on the right-hand side, but it's not a volume overload issue. It's a pressure overload issue. Um, and so it doesn't discriminate between those two, but it does allow us to trigger further assessment for the patient and look for the reason for that pressure overload. So I think, you know, this is both a, an advantage and a disadvantage potentially. We also in our cardiac population have a lot of patients who have chronic IVC plethora. Um, anybody with uh, right-sided pressure overload in a long-standing way will have IVC plethora and this persists post-cardiac surgery. This is also true in athletes and so on, but that's the reason why we continue on with multiple measurements. Um, mechanical ventilation poses potentially a challenge for us. Um, we know that it affects IVC diameter or at least distensibility. Um, when patients have high PEEP, their IVC distensibility is decreased. But uh, the, again, this is the value of multiple indices. I think um, the other trouble is, you know, we have to be aware that our patients often have rhythm abnormalities or they're paced. So in uh, cardiac surgery, we often have patients in AFib where they don't have an A reversal and they always have a smaller S wave because in the hepatic vein Doppler because, um, because of the, the lack of the preceding A wave. Um, tricuspid regurgitation, all these patients will have S-ray reversal if it's uh, severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And anytime you have atrial contraction against a closed tricuspid valve, it's going to appear that there's volume overload. Um, and uh, so even in things like short RP, AVNRT, or anything like that, where you're contracting against that closed tricuspid valve, you'll have some abnormality. So I think it's just really critical to understand the anatomy and the patient's physiology, and it may trigger further assessment and like echocardiographic assessment. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think this is a very key important message that the BEXIS does not differentiate between the volume overload, which actually declines the, which actually declines the, you, you can say the compliance and make the system more elastic sort of thing versus the pressure overload, like, you know, embolism. And in both the situation, you may find like the BEXIS positive, and it is very important to differentiate between the two. And maybe in these situation, you know, we should not rely on the one modality. We should also combine with the LBOT or the RBOT VTI also to look for like how much is the volume generated by the right heart or the left heart, and also to look at the lungs, how much congested they are. So I think it is a multi-modality approach, and this is one of the very good approach uh, in this multi-modality multi algorithm. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. And now the next question is for Dr. Uh, Gordon again. And uh, this is related to the, you know, the team, like this hybrid team uh, or this multidisciplinary team uh, uh, organization. So the question is coming is like, when do you think like just the general anesthetist can handle these cases? Or do you think that these all cases should be handled by the cardiac anesthesiologist? Uh, this is one of the questions. All right, thanks for that question. That's a good question because when we initially wrote, uh, implemented PERT, it was mainly general anesthetics, uh, anesthesiologists uh, performing these cases. Um, I think, uh, unfortunately, it has somewhat to do with HR availability because one of our sites, uh, the cardiac is not the cardiac site. So those, there's very little cardiac anesthesia trained uh, um, and anesthesiologist there. Uh, fortunately, with the kind of newer generation, a lot more of them becoming uh, ultrasound adept and uh, TT adept and even T adept, some of our colleagues. So uh, I think it kind of depends uh, in discussion with the PERT team to pay, uh, based on the stability of the patient, what type of escalation of care is available. Because one site may, if you're not going to have can cardiac anesthesiologist at a, let's say, a peripheral site that's doing these, uh, then you're likely not going to have cardiac surgery support as well. So for definitely for the more unstable patients on high inotropes, uh, I would do those with cardiac anesthesiologists at a, a site that has ECMO capabilities as well. Okay, so this is the last question which is coming for Dr. Ruma Bose. 
And this question is, uh, so that means the understanding is that the structural heart imaging, this person has special skill set to not only understand the 3D amazing, but simultaneously understand the MRI, CT scan, you know, so like this is again a multi-modality approach. So this structural heart amazing person is capable of simultaneously understanding the images coming from MRI, images coming from the CT scan, and he can reconstitute the 3D images to basically fill in the gap in the understanding or in the uh, desired imaging. So the question is, what are the barriers to implementing this uh, a universal training curriculum for this structural heart imaging, where these people can be trained in all these three modern modalities together. So realistically speaking, it's not possible. So I look at it as somebody who um, in my shoes is an expert in, uh, or, you know, uh, adept, let's say adept at 3D imaging because of my uh, training in periop echocardi echocardiography. But the others, I should have a working knowledge. It doesn't have to be in depth. So if a floor image is being projected on the screen, you are um, able to understand what dimension it is and which, uh, so it's what you're looking at the echo kind of correlate with that, uh, almost like a fusion imaging in your head. So I, I don't think it's possible for us to be experts in all of the different imaging modalities and more that are coming down the line. And the second part of what uh, the, the barriers are to, ex to uh, implementing the uh, structural heart curriculum is again, the variability of, um, of uh, cases, not all centers are doing all the high level cases. You don't have people, at least in anesthesia, who are trained to teach other people. Most of the people are just, uh, you know, themselves getting comfortable. So we are kind of trying to step into that space. And um, uh, I don't think there could be, there are other specialities which have done this kind of multimodal approach, uh, for example, neuro. Uh, the surgeons realized that, um, you know, transcatheter approach was getting into their field. They started learning to, you know, uh, do a dual kind of fellowship and transcatheter approach as well as the open neurosurgical approaches. So I see something of a hybrid kind of training down the line. And um, our goal is to kind of, you know, tell our colleagues uh, across the world in the North America to step into that field, make that extra effort because we have the expertise of, um, of um, you know, structural heart imaging from our training in cardiac anesthesia. Uh, thank you very much. So just uh, to summarize from this uh, talk, I think there are certain very key points which we learned from these uh, three speakers. The first and foremost is that we have to move from the concept of I to the concept of V, because it is a, all these approaches are high definition. They require teamwork. They require mental sharing. They require collaborations. So that is the first message I think which we take from these curriculum. The second important message which we get from this uh, seminar is that. Uh, BEXUS is one part of the multimodality approach to these sick patients, and it is very, very crucial to differentiate between the pressure overload versus the volume overload, and that's why you have to uh, uh, use the other modalities for uh, this uh, modality also. And finally, for this pulmonary embolectomy, actually this non-invasive pulmonary embolectomy with this uh, uh, NGO back, which basically simultaneously do the suction and push the blood back into the patient uh, is a very interesting modality. And, uh, uh, but again, here again, a team approach is uh, uh, required. And the, uh, I think the only indication for surgical pulmoembolectomy will be when the clot is in transit or it has crossed into the left atrium, where these patients may not look hemodynamically that unstable, but actually they are very sick patients because they have pop-up mechanism in the form of opening of the ASD and that's why they are too hypoxic.
but clinically hemodynamically stable and probably not in that much of respiratory distress. Like we all know, like in the congenital heart diseases, the children might be sitting at 70 of the saturation, but they are not tachypneic. So same thing happens in this situation also. So thank you very much, all the presenters. And I thank uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan. I thank Dr. William Pope for their presence. And I again congratulate all Indians, and I will say all the uh, population on this globe for another big leap by the mankind to, and India is the fourth country now to step into the lunar club where they have uh, successfully landed their uh, satellite. Thank you very much, and thank you. Have a nice day, and good night for others on the other side of the globe. Thank you, Virendra and team. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Okay. And good night is to all. Is Dr. Uma anywhere? Yes, sir. Uma, will you like to say some words? How yes, you sir. How you yes, appreciate sir. it? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was, it was an extremely uh, excellent uh, webinar on uh, cardiothoracic anesthesia and a lot of uh, concepts of even. Uh, experts in that field could get clearer after this webinar and i thoroughly enjoyed it uh thank you very much sir for making me part of this and uh, i would really appreciate the efforts uh, taken by the moderator and all the speakers uh, and especially radha krishnan sir and he has taken out his time for the uh, very important webinar of ica long live ica and thank you sir good night just uh, one thank i will ask for one comment from dr bill pope if uh, you would like to say anything uh, Bill. thanks for Andrew. in actual fact what i like is what you have just identified and that is that for all of these new techniques that are being developed and they will continue to have others and as as ai becomes involved in the system as well uh the importance of having some form of organized training and agreed of training in different directions so for example in Canada all specialists now the Royal College has required that they do competency by design where from the time you enter a residency program you have to achieve certain standards before you can move on to others and those standards have to be met by all people trained in all areas it's, it's absolutely crucial for this sort of area that this is much be, be developed and I appreciate Dr. Bose's comments that ideally there should be a generic curriculum at the moment because there aren't enough people and enough anesthesiologists doing it we're not able to provide that but well done for at least making a stab at it and I'd ask Dr. Thorlifson up in particular what is the present standard in Canada is there an attempt across the training programs in Canada to have a concept that is there is a curriculum that, that individuals must achieve for Vexus in particular or for POCUS more broadly for both for both so um there is in the national curriculum for anesthesia there is a baseline expectation of POCA skills for the residents and it's an understanding of of uh, ultrasound physics and uh, basic concepts of knobology with the ultrasounds and uh, some basic ability to do POCA. So that is part of the national curriculum. Um, how that's being administered, of course, is totally different at each site, depending on resources. Um, but the expectation is there. So the Royal College has said, yes, this is something that we need to be doing. Go for it. And, uh, and so that's where we're at at the moment. Um, VEXIS in particular has not been standardized across the country, but this is something that people are doing uh, routinely. So that is something we should consider for the future, for sure. I, and that's just as a regulator, a former regulator as well, I can tell you that makes my heart glad. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bill. Uh, back to Radha, uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan. Thank you, Dr. Virendra, Dr. Bill, Dr. Mullen, Dr. Ramabos, and Dr. Gordon Ali. It was an excellent webinar. I appreciate your wedding. It is not I, but we. Yes, with we conceptually, we will be able to advance in the newer technologies. Unfortunately, we have not started Vexus as well as structural heart imaging in India. And 
cathedral-based work is going on at most of the places. And I'm sure the scope of bringing the vexes as well as structural heart imaging is not that far. In another three to five years' time, it may start because the curriculum has to be restructured. Now it is nowhere near the curriculum which is being practiced or tutored in India. Well, I really thank and on behalf of I. Oops. Thank you. I think the webinar. Time I think we is lost over. him. Yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> we are good to go. And I again thank. I think the next webinar is going to be on August 13, and uh, uh, I will be uh, very honored if you are present there just to give a smart comment in the end on 30th August, same time. Thank you very much, all these speakers. Thanks, guys. And we have a nice day.